Um, hi. So, is is everyone here who's going to be here? Okay, so I guess this is everyone then. Hello, I'm Demi Marie Obenauer, Invisible Things Lab. And I'm here to talk about making about hostile multi tenancy on commodity GPUs and to propose. Uh let me, I can't hear you. Oh. Yes, it's Chromium. Um. I'm, I'm here to talk about in, about na about enabling secure multi-tenancy on commodity GPUs. <laughs> so, if you look at current multi-tenancy approaches, aka virtualization in a lot of contexts, though it's not always synonymous for GPUs, they generally have one of a few different properties. Some of them have really large attack surface. That would be stuff like VTG or VirGL slash VirdIO. Some of them only support uh, one VM at a time per GPU. That would be PCI pass through without SRIOV. Some of them require high end hardware, as in thousands of dollars. That would be SRIOV based PCI pass through. There's also Microsoft's GPU PV, but that's proprietary, so it's not suitable for free and open source software. Or there's some combination of the above. And that's kind of annoying. So for what do we need from a good hostile multi-tenancy solution for commodity GPUs? It needs to provide support for games and other GPU-intensive software. It needs to be secure enough to turn it on by default. It needs fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. Sorry. Uh, we have technical issues. Also, Matthew, please uh, be careful about your language. Uh, Demi, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now it, everything is great. Okay. Anyway, not, none of the existing solutions meet these requirements. And that's really annoying. So here's what, so what I'm proposing is a minimal user space graphics driver. Minimal meaning that we keep the amount of privileged code, code that can directly talk to hardware, to a minimum. And that's important because less code, less attack surface, less likely to, less likely to have bugs, you know, usual reasons. Same, same as the microkernel minimality principle. Why user space? Because you don't have to wait on the kernel to iterate. When you update, you don't have to reboot. If there's a fault and the thing crashes, and you ju it just gets restarted by your service manager. And it, it should expose a well-defined API that's documented, that's transport independent, and that's specified separately from the source code. It should be written in a modern memory safe language to provide safe abstractions and avoid memory corruption vulnerabilities. It, um, 
in case you're wondering, by the way, if you're going to use formal verification, if you're going to formally verify it, then any language counts as memory safe because a formally verified code has that doesn't have any bugs will be memory safe. And it should use capabilities for access control. That's what SEL4 uses. That's what a lot of other modern systems use. And it has a lot of advantages. So why minimal? Well, modern GPUs have full virtual memory support. GPU code is restricted by page tables, just like CPU code is. Ideally, we won't need to perform any sort of really complex static analysis of shaders. In practice, there might very well be a lot of caveats there. I don't know if GPU hardware's instruction decoding is robust enough to avoid that. That said, hopefully, if it has to be done, it can at least be simple. Um, that this is some, an area where the hardware experts will have to speak. Will have to de determine if it, it's actually if that hope is actually viable. Why? Why user space? Well, there's a few reasons. We can use modern programming languages such as Rust. I, such as because Rust is just an example there. Any. Um, there's, there's no fundamental reason that I just, I just picked Rust because it's one that I like and use, but there's lots of other possibilities. The point is we're not just limited by what's supported in the kernel. We can use the full standard library, stuff like opening files and map, all that nice stuff just works. We don't have to use special kernel programming paradigms. We can develop faster. There's no need for a reboot to restart the driver. The driver can be sandboxed via an IOMMU, so it can't comp at least directly compromise the rest of the system. Now, depend whether or not that protection is actually is actually good depends, but it at least makes accidental at least reduces the likelihood of it crashing the system by accident. And if we wanted to, we could embed the program, the driver into a user space program, such as the Whalen compositor. Is that a good idea? Probably not, see minimality earlier. But it's possible, and it's a cute trick. <laughs> so why a well-defined API? It, it, for one, it means that the specification can be separate from the source code. And that's really nice from the point of view of API clients. It means that your API client knows what it should be doing. It means that you can have proper conformance testing. It means that there's less likelihood of bugs on both ends because there's a document that describes what both sides should actually be doing and that tests can be written against. And it should also be transport independent. Clients can communicate over AF Unix if it's, say, in a container or a flat pack or something. AF VSOC if you're using something like KVM. They could use VChans for Zen. If you're on SEL4, you could use SEL4 IPC, or you could even use a, net, a network. Now, that likely likely be rather tricky because share, not shared memory but the point still stands. And it's easier to fuzz by a substantial margin because the fuzzer knows what it should be doing. And why memory safe? This I'm not even going to go into a whole lot of detail about because it's already a very well-known situation. <laughs> this is just one link on the subject. Why capabilities? There's lots of resources on capability-based access control. I'm not going to go into all of them here. But the point, the point is that a capability, it both designates a resource and it authorizes access. Without an appropriate capability, you can't access the resource. In fact, you can't even express an action that would access the resource. And that's really nice because it avoids all sorts of confused deputy attacks. If I want to, if I pass a I there, there's no if there's no way for me to get a capability to Etsy Shadow, 
I can't pass some privileged process, a capability that says for, for Etsy shadow. And therefore I can't trick said privileged process into writing into Etsy shadow on my behalf. And that's really nice. It's also used by a lot of other systems. It's used by SEL4. It's used by Capsicum for FreeBSD. It's used by Cloud ABI. It's used by the WebAssembly system interface, WASI. And as I mentioned, it avoids all sorts of confused EPU bugs. And that's really nice. Finally, let's write this. GPU multi-tenancy should be readily available. Giving VMs or other untrusted code for that matter, access to hardware accelerated graphics should be safe. If you're someone like me who relies on sandboxing a lot, whether it be via something like Cubes OS or anything else, you shouldn't need to have a completely separate machine for gaming. And it's up to us to make this happen. I can't do it alone. No other one person can do it alone. But I think we can do it together. And I think that we should do it together because the benefits outweigh the, outweigh the effort required. This really is important. So anyway, I guess... Now it's time to actually start the discussion because this is a workshop and it's a call for discussion and a call for starting an implementation. So what do people think? Hello? Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, uh, capability uh, about capability enforcement? Uh, like uh, if you have some uh, command stream to the uh, GPU, uh, do you uh, want to reconstruct uh, it based on the driver API or uh, just analyze uh, what, uh, what client uh, uh, sent and uh, either accept it or re reject individual commands. Commands. So that's an that's not something that I had ultimate I've decided upon. That ultimately the final decision on that should probably be made by people who know more about the hardware. My intuition is that. The, the, way, the way I would, that said, my opinion is that if a client tries to do something that they're not allowed to, that's a protocol error and they should be disconnected. If so, in the case of the command stream, I think, well, ideally, there wouldn't need to be any parsing of it because that would all be handled in hardware. But in term, I would say that the, like at least as far as instruction by instructions and access, I, I think, but it, I don't think, like, I, I think, let me put it this way. If the client does something it shouldn't, just disconnect it because that's a client bug. Otherwise, I'd say, as far as the details, I don't know whether it would be simpler and have lower attack surface to have the driver reconstruct the stream based on API calls or whether it would be best for the driver to validate the stream. My intuition is the former, because, but I'm not certain. Yes, I'm mostly asking about not uh, what to do when uh, when something is not allowed, but how to detect uh, what the client is uh, trying to do. For example, if you uh, design capabilities for, um, I don't know, accessing some uh, memory, uh, specific memory uh, memory buffers, or maybe even parts of the screen, then how, how you enforce that 
the driver really, the, the client uh, <coughs> is not using some uh, uh, obscure operation to uh, operate outside of those boundaries. So my hope is that that can be left to GPU side page tables and that that would be enforced by the hardware. Now, whether or not that actually works in practice is another question. As I said, not a hardware expert. I'm so the the ideal situation is say a shader tries to do something it shouldn't. The GPU act the G, the it can't because that the memory that it does is it supposed to access isn't mapped into its page tables. And similarly, the Wayland compositor it can access the frame buffer because the frame buffer is mapped into its page tables. And it's able to get the frame buffer mapped into its page tables because it presented a capability that, that authorized it to do so. Now, there is the question of does real hardware work that way? Again, I, my understanding is that it does. I could be wrong. Obviously, any sort of instructions that could allow pa the page table-based isolation to be bypassed would need to be disallowed. Does anyone here? Uh, does anyone here have more information about that? Unfortunately, no, not me at least. And I think, think it's a bit uh, amusing that uh, after moving from New Zealand to Carmel side. Uh, the graphics tax now uh, moves back to uh, wants to to move back to user land, but uh, from the from what from from the impression I have uh, from other parts of the system, I have the, imp the impression that uh, IOMMUs on x on x86 hardware is still very primitive and uh, not very well, very well supported, but maybe I'm wrong too. So the reason, so out of all of this, probably the, le the least important part of it is that it run in user space. I personally am a huge fan of microkernels where it basically has to run in user space. Ideally, the same driver should be, the, like ideally the driver should be, should program against some, should be written against some sort of API so that it could be built as, say, a Linux kernel module, a user space process running on SEL4, a kernel driver running on, say, FreeBSD or NetBSD, et cetera. The, as I said, the, the detail, that's not really the, the point. I think that I, I'd rather it run in user space I also would rather stuff like file systems in the network stack be in user space. I do think that it, I, I think that being able to run it in user space would be a huge improvement, if nothing else, just for debug for debugging purposes and for development. Even if the architecture of the system that it's going to be used in in production requires it to run in the kernel space for some reason or another. I, other than that, I'm honestly, and also I'd really rather it not be in C unless formal methods or similar are gonna be used to guarantee that it doesn't have any memory corruption vulnerabilities, which isn't, that's another reason for wanting it to, but uh, that's, um, other than that, I'm not really, not really certain. Like, the, the other stuff is far more important to me. And also when I say the same driver, I mean same source code, not same binaries. Also another, another thing that 
I, hopefully was in, was implicit from the from the talk in the slides, but that may or may not have actually been in practice. Sorry, was that this is not meant to provide an emulated GPU to a guest that appears to be the real thing. The assumption is that one is, can't that one has control of the guests and that one can write PV aware. Uh, drivers that are aware for the guests that are aware of this and speak the corresponding protocol. Now, it might be possible to emulate the actual hardware in Kimi or similar, but that's not quite in scope for this project. So, what else do you this is actually, I think, an uh, important design point. Uh, what uh, what kind of uh, API uh, on what uh, level this API should be? Should be uh, should it be uh, specific to uh, the underlying uh, hardware? Like, if you have uh, AMD uh, GPUs, should the uh, API be specific to to the uh, AMD? Or should it be generic to work with uh, any uh, hardware beneath? So parts of it are definitely going to have to be <coughs> GPU specific because having a compiler, a shader compiler run in the driver is just a bad idea. So at the very least, that part isn't going to be GPU specific. My understanding is that lots of other stuff like memory allocations will also wind up being GP specific, but stuff like the, like say for instance, the framing protocol, the way serialization is done of serialization of messages and such is done. That should be, that part I think can and should be GPU agnostic simply because it's easier to implement that way. And I don't think it would be a large performance hit at all. What up? Uh, I also, th what, uh, so, yes. Um, oh, and the other thing is that there should be a, there should be, like, like that said, like if something can reasonably be abstracted, okay, let me put it this way. It's not the micro driver's job to abstract over the hardware. It is the job of the AP of the client libraries to do so to the extent that is practical and does not cause too much trouble. Um, okay, but uh, this way, uh, it means uh, you need a custom driver on the uh, client uh, VM side, driver or library or whatever, uh, for each operation, uh, operating system you want to support and for each graphics uh, graphic device you want to support. Uh, which makes this uh, really hard to maintain or with sensible uh, hardware support. Uh, okay. Right. So that's a good that's a good point. It's one that I haven't actually fully thought fully thought through yet. That said, I think it can be. I think it can be. I think it can be avoided. Though. As far as binaries, I think, yeah, it'll prob one will probably need something like that. There might be tricks involving WASM and loading code at runtime or something like that. But I think at a source level, it, it should be possible to split it into a part that is driver dependent, I mean, that is host OS, that is guest OS dependent, but not hardware dependent. 
and that does things like, for the most part, and a part that is that is guest OS independent but hardware dependent. So the guest dependent, the OS dependent part would handle things like registering device files, I and such like that. And the device dependent part would handle things like parse like command stream processing, just to give an example. And that avoids it, that if, it, if that can be done, and I very much think it can, that turns it from an n times n problem at the source code level to an n plus n problem, which is much more manageable. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but I think it will be extremely hard. Uh, see that uh, we have currently open source drivers for uh, some NVIDIA cards, some uh, GPU, uh, some uh, AMD cards, some uh, Intel cards, and they share the OS, uh, <laughs> OS dependent part in card, uh, in form of Linux kernel API and uh, the hardware dependent part is still a huge uh, product. And I think what you are pr proposing is uh, doing the same uh, work from scratch from uh, for each of those platforms, which I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, I'm not sure if it's realistically without some uh, uh, a lot of funding and a lot of uh, enthusiasts uh, supporting these efforts. Okay, I'll be honest here. That's the Achilles Helos proposal. That, <laughs> in many ways, this is a long shot because this is, this is what you get when a security person thinks what should a graph what should a graphic stack look like not what can we do with the building blocks we have today so in many ways yes this is this is this has issues in that regard and that it is far fetched that said it might very well be possible to implement some of these on top of existing components it won't have as high an assurance. It won't have as good assurance guarantees as if it was direct, as if it was designed this way from scratch. But I think it could still be significantly better than what we have today. So, for instance, one could write a wrapper for the AMD G AMD kernel module that, just to give an example, that did such like things like input validation, made sure that you can't pass bad arguments, only support it, only exposed the parts that were actually like needed, stuff like that. I think, <laughs> The one now, the elephant in the room is going to be NVIDIA because binary blob. My in my intuition and my initial reaction is as far as the answer to that would be we don't support that. We only support stuff for which there is good documentation. In practice, that might be a very hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. And so, yeah, that's one of the reasons why this is, I'd love to see this implemented. It's, but it's not gonna be easy. I'll, I'll put it that way. That said, Gnode did manage to do something similar, at least for one Intel GPU. They managed to 
write a GPU multiplexer, and I think it was around 15,000 lines of C++. And that's what made me even consider that this was possible. Because they did it. Or something like it. And I find that very encouraging. Neobrain, Matthew? Um, yeah, but I think Intel graphics are not really high performance uh, graphics. And <laughs> they're I know. probably much, much simpler to, uh, to handle because, uh, because of much smaller API. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, for the uh, for avoiding these uh, old problems, uh, I think uh, one of two things, uh, one of two approaches uh, could be chosen. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, isolation enforcement part uh, needs to be uh, as small and as robust as possible. But then uh, you can pos probably uh, have some uh, intermediate uh, component that. Uh, uh, on one side has this uh, talks to this uh, small driver and on the other side uh, emulate the original graphics so you can reuse the uh, unmodified drivers uh, that? If that would be possible then uh, we can avoid a lot of uh, this support matrix uh, uh, issues uh, another uh, idea is to uh, ex uh, um, expose some uh, unified API for uh, uh, independent of the uh, device, but I think that's way harder. Yeah, I think I think that is an absolutely awesome approach. I think also just to be clear, there is one part that I think can and should be reused. One part of existing GPU drivers that can and should be reused without any modifications. And that's the shader compiler. And my understanding is that's a non-insignificant fraction of the work in writing a GPU driver is the user space shader compiler. Is that accurate? Probably. But I don't know if the shader compiler has the proper instrumentation to make sure that uh, the address space does not uh, go out oh. of the zone and so on. Oh, of course not. The, the, the shader compiler is considered untrusted here. Yeah. It's the, the point being that it's a substantial piece of chunk that should be able to be reused almost unchanged. I think I mean, the emulation, like emulate an unmodified user an unmodified like an un like have the emulation in, done in a non security critical piece to re reduce the support matrix i think that's a fantastic idea i think i am not sure whether it's practical i don't because I'm not a hardware expert i think if it can be done it'd be a great idea What do people think? Mm. What do you think about a drastically different approach uh, to have a, a graphics, actual graphics card uh, to do the uh, all the separation uh, and uh, expose different context in form of uh, SRIOV uh, virtual functions? And uh, of course, some graphics are more, more uh, robust in this and some are less, but this needs some uh, validation, maybe some fuzzing of the uh, GPUs or something like that. Uh, but then uh, no uh, untrusted uh, client would have uh, the actual uh, frame buffer access uh, and you would uh, do uh, composing of the actual video output using some other method like looking glass or something like that. Uh, what do you think? I think that's a great idea if the hardware supports it. The problem is that a lot of hardware doesn't support it. And one of the goals of this is it should work. One of the, one of the goals of this is it should support 
the graphics hardware people already have. I am not aware of consumer cards that actually support SRIOV. I know that Intel cards support some sort of virtualization, but I don't know if they support SRIOV per se. And also, rely on, um, yeah, basically that. It's that I'd prefer, it's that. If the hardware supports it, great. And if the implementation is sufficiently robust, but I don't know if the hardware that users actually have meets that criterion. Because one of the goals of this is, yeah, basically that. Uh, uh, I I think uh, you've seen the uh, demo from uh, Arthur yesterday. I have. Uh, and I have. I'm not sure about specific what other hardware uh, uh, is supported this way, but uh, I think he found a way to enable SRIOV on graphics that uh, some of the vendors did not in initially intended to. Uh, which yeah. may be uh, may allow to use this method on more cards that uh, we can right now. That's a good point. <laughs> There's two things that make me nervous about it. One is if it requires flashing the like flat like using special hardware to overwrite the spy flash. That's not something most people are going to be able to do. Just it's it's the kind of thing that most people. It's not something that can be done in pure software, and it's not the kind of thing that you can expect most most users to be able to do. Because one of the goals one of the goals of this is to support it's to meet the end users where they are, basically. The other the other the other worry I have is that even if is it since it's not if it's not supported by the vendor vendors probably won't won't issue any sort of security of security errata for it and it won't be officially security supported and that makes me nervous again great idea i, I think and just to be clear i think the libvfio approach is great i I want them to succeed. I 100% I support them. I think this is, I don't see this as competing with that. I see this as complementary to that. Uh, Matthew, uh, Neobrain, mm -hmm. what do you think? Because I haven't heard all that much from either of you. Well, I was uh, wondering if a first step would not just be to implement something that just expose a dump frame buffer to, to each client, and that the simple API would be get me a frame buffer of this and this dimension, maybe be able to resize it, and then let the application just copy pixels there. Uh, this is safe. This may be easy to implement, and uh, for many applications, except games and 3D stuff, uh, with nowadays CPUs, the performance may be okay for uh, for uh, for guy applications uh, in this kind of, in this kind of simple environment where uh, you, you limit the the number of issues that you have if you if you start uh, uh, exposing shaders and uh, other kind of uh, accelerations. That's what Cubes RS already does, basically, and. We're working on making it on making it faster by trying to reduce the number of copies. The sad, the sad truth though is that the graphics world is moving in the other direction. GTK four, for instance, has more CSS invalidations than GTK three, and so it's slower in software rendering. The which is unfortunate, but that's the reality. There's ways to work around that with theming, but they come at the cost of worse user experience. And also users want to play games. Yes. Sure. They do. 
and that's yeah and that that that's what makes this hard you just want to play games graphics toolkit developers assume that a gpu is present and so for instance with gtk4 again using it as an example the two backends it supports are the Cairo backend, which is incredibly slow, and OpenGL and Vulkan. And so if you don't have hardware OpenGL, you fall back to LVM pipe. Yes. You don't, there's no oh. renderer that's designed to be fast in software. Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I really don't uh, know current hardware very much, but I really have the impression that without more help from the hardware, without a really working IO MMU or IO SRV, it's, it's really going to be painful to, to get something that's, that you can trust. From my experience, the, the, the hardware is always very, very uh, offers a very wide range of uh, ways to uh, to try to uh, to overcome the the protection that will do that you will try to implement. And uh, basically, is that the? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Basically, in my mind, when you have a full when you have access to some part of the hardware, it's basically equivalent to having access to the full uh, features of the of the hardware. It's it's really doing a bad job at uh, partitioning things uh, at this level. So, are you are you saying that it's possible for a shader to bypass the page tables and access physical memory directly? I'm not sure, but uh, I would not bet that it's not possible. Okay, that would be a, a nasty problem. Uh, and also an another approach, by the way, is something like Wa Wasm. If if something like Wasm for the GPU could be implemented, that would be that would be great. And, but that is, or if there's some sort of reasonably implementable static analysis that can be done on shaders, for instance, if one can enumerate all possible branch targets and require that that shader compilers emit any necessary metadata to make this easy. But if, if the hardware is... Now, I, I imagine that for at least some hardware like Android, like some mobile GPUs, for instance, I imagine it should be possible simply because user to root on Android is a fiercely defended security boundary, same for iOS. But again, I, if the hard, the hardware has to, the idea here is the hardware has to at least provide the equivalent of user versus kernel isolation. The point, the idea here is to avoid having to provide the second layer of isolation at the at a high, what's effectively a hypervisor level. Yes, for me, the, the, this is the, the, the difficult part. When you look at vulnerabilities like uh, spectrum meltdown and, and so on on the CPU side, how can we be sure that uh, the, there are no such kind of uh, things lurking around uh, on the GPU side? Well, for yeah, Spectre, for currently, when uh, you run uh, several apl applications uh, with uh, access to G uh, to the GPU, uh, it sh uh, it would be nice uh, to ensure that uh, one application cannot mess with an, uh, with another. Like if you have uh, two applications with uh, with both using some. Uh, 3D acceleration, GPU acceleration, right? Yes, and my understanding is that current GPU vendors already support this and have an, and ha will and have issued CVEs for when that isolation can be bypassed. So it's not so like I. That's what makes me. So either there's something I'm missing here, which there very well could be because I'm not a hardware expert, but if they did, but I'm not sure what it is. 
or this should be doable. So if the answer is this can't be done because no, I'm not saying that this cannot be done. It's just that uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's uh, it's uh, possible uh, with the current state of the of the hardware. You may uh, you may find some difficulties. Okay, I, can you? <laughs> but okay, I have a feeling there's some. Okay, gotcha. I'm okay. Anyway, so that's annoying. <laughs> well, the, the problem is that we probably would need more people who actually have done some low level hardware work uh, there today, but unfortunately, there is no one. So we don't have much data to. Yeah, that that would be an issue. This is if the hardware can't provide the isolation, can't provide even basic isolation, then the only hope is software fault isolation, and that makes things a lot trickier. That said, I would if that's actually the case, if it actually can't, then I'd expect to see a bunch of CVs filed against things like the Intel GPU driver. Assuming that people have done the research. If, if this starts to be a to, to be some some path that that is interesting for for people wanting to exploit vulnerabilities and to get into systems, then we may probably we will see some more research there and probably more CVs. Yeah, that's. That's, as I said, that is the, the biggest weaknesses here are the amount of effort required and the assumption that the hardware can provide isolation. My understanding is that more P is that the hardware is getting better. And I, and I don't just mean SRIOV, but like other stuff as well. Yes, hopefully. I, I think the the chip designers, uh, Intel, AMD, and so on, they have they have discovered that uh, uh, there are uh, all these kinds of hardware level vulnerabilities that are very difficult to fix after the fact, and they will probably be uh, be more careful uh, for the next designs. And, we can hope that this will also be true for the for the GPUs and not only for CPUs. Yeah. Also, the other thing that makes me gives me some degree of confidence is the is how is Intel's reaction to the famous GPU leak bug. Yes, and, and the, the other fact is that I know, but even if I don't, if I don't have details, that on the uh, on the HPC side, uh, Nvidia, for example, is uh, investing a lot on virtualizing the, the GPUs to allow several people to run CUDA jobs in parallel on high-end uh, GPUs, and they will probably also take care about uh, security there. And even if CUDA is not directly a shader for for GPU, it's still the same kind of architectures and uh, yeah issues. So I would be, I would not, yeah. Also, yes. So the So I guess the question ultimately, I guess 
the the annoying part obviously is is that <laughs> I can come up with ideas, but I don't have I'm not an expert on the hardware. Yeah, me neither, unfortunately. So, to... Yeah. Um, so yeah, from just, I guess the other, this is very much, here's what I'd like to see happen. It's what I hope to see happen. It's what I think should happen, if, at least eventually. I think the question is, but there is the question of, has its time come yet? Not completely, but Many projects like that take uh, it really takes years to actually uh, come to something that's usable. Uh, Agreed. It, this is a lot of effort. And uh, well, I think it's nice to start uh, thinking about it and uh, start telling people that this is something that we need. Uh, generally. Uh, I think that the approach of QGIS is nice and addresses real issues that many that that, that many people in even in corporate security environments don't really take into account. I've seen a few places where people say, "Well, you need to have two computers, one to work on uh, our uh, main development of uh, secret projects and so on, and you have another uh, system to handle your email, your uh, your browsing and the web and so on." But this basically never really works. So the, the, the people working there cannot figure out how to properly separate between the two computers and they generally end up with uh, tricks uh, uh, of whatever is left open on USB keys or other stuff to, to transfer data between the two and breaking the, uh, the separation. Yeah, that's, that's what Cubes is meant to yeah. avoid the need for. And basically, like, hardware... Like, right now, I think the lack of hardware accelerated graphics is one of Cubes OS's main weaknesses. I think Spectrum OS, now Spectrum OS does have hardware accelerated graphics, but I think it uses the Vertile Wayland plus Virgil approach, which has the attack surface problem. And, now, is I think Verdio Wayland is actually a decent approach as long as there's some filtering. It's the Virgil that is the that is the annoying part. If there was some sort of core language for GPUs, the way Wasm is for CPUs, that would make things. That's I'd be a lot more comfortable with that. I, I just never got why the the GPU world is so uh, so split in small different uh, components and and nothing really stand out and never came uh, ever came out. I, I really don't know exactly why. I don't know why either. I think that when it comes to One of the things that really, really encourages me is that somehow Microsoft managed to pull off GPU PV. I don't know how they did it. It's proprietary after all, but they did it. Yes, that's, that's a good sign. But... And my understanding is that it meets all the requirements except for being open source. 
Somehow they did it. And it's a defended security boundary. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they did it. I don't know what the attack surface is, but the fact that they did it is really, really encouraging because it is meant for this exact use case. Yes. And my assumption is if, if they can do it, then so can we as in the open source community, given enough time. Yes. Again, we would need some people more from the from the hardware and the driver side. So yeah. To get some some light on what how to proceed from there. I agree. And I think okay. I think that somehow this has something has to something has to change because right now the trade off is the cho your choices are slow or secure and that's really unfortunate and software rendering is getting effectively deprecated by toolkit by toolkit vendors yes, i think that's also a bit unfortunate because they even so if they add some value with uh, more a pleasing stuff if the cost is to, to have to give up on security because uh, it's not uh, fast enough anymore, then it may be a bit useless. We can probably do nice graphics with uh, fewer other acceleration. I think so too. I think that one of the problems is that, G is that a lot of people don't, is that people just don't consider the no GPU case. One of the, one of the GNOME developer, one of the GTK develop, well, actually, I'm not even going to go there because this is something I can discuss, but I'll discuss it in private. But um, the point being that with C, that now if there was if there was some way to make um, to make L to make software rendering faster in a subset of cases that happen to match the ones that actual toolkits rely on, that would be great. But also there's the issue that making that the things that help software rendering also tend to be things like getting rid of drop shadows and using flat, getting rid of gradients, using flat colors and other and basically getting rid of a lot of visual cues and doing so makes the ux people sad yeah, well i'm not sure exactly but so for example uh, android uh, went back and the, the, the material look is quite uh, flat and uh, with no shades and um, not many 3D effects. So this... What about things like drop shadows, though? But are, are there still the drop shadows on uh, Android material uh, look? I think so. I'm not sure. But... Uh, the, it's not... It's really, really it's not less, something... It's probably less visible than in previous versions then. I'm pulling up a conversation that I had in the past on the subject.
One, one thing I know is that it's really important to have uh, quick feedback when you are using a tactile screen, because uh, this is what makes the, uh, the UX more fluid, uh, that whenever you touch the screen, and it, said that it has an action that you get some visual feedback uh, quickly, but that feedback doesn't need necessarily to have uh, complicated uh, 3D effects, in my opinion. So yeah, like, well, I think the problem is that even if it could be implemented without relying on that, the toolkit vendors want to rely on it. Yeah. Because the toolkit vendor, the toolkit design writers aren't worried about software rendering performance. Yeah, I know, but I, well, I don't know if there is a, an easy way out of this kind of trap. For example, With, on, hence why I proposed seeing if we can make hardware rendering secure. Yes. Which is the whole reason for this talk. It's can hardware rendering be made secure? Perfect. Because if if we have to render, if we have to somehow make software rendering fast, that's going to mean a lot of patches to things like GTK. And that's going to mean somehow convincing somebody's going to actually have to maintain it at GTK. Games still won't work. Web, web GPU still won't work. Firefox just recent, recently got rid of its basic compositor, which was the software, their software renderer. And now they're using uh, web render, com uh, a software version of web render, which is a bit slower, usable, but slower. And the trend, the trend is towards a suit. And, and also battery life on mobile is going to be bad with software is going to be worse with software rendering because it uses more power. And that really sucks. Like most of the computing power of a modern device is in the GPU. And that and wasting it and not being able to use it because of security is not a good situation. Yes. But I don't know if, uh, if a 2D GPU from 20 years ago who built with modern, smaller, uh, Small engraving technologies uh, would uh, use uh, more power or less power than the, the current GPUs. And if we could do something like who's A, who's going to manufacture it, and B, who's oh, going to I, I know, I know that it's, it's a pure dream. Uh, yeah, and, it's and like, I, I guess no my, it's not doing, uh, never, no one is ever going this way, but still. Yeah, it's like, from my perspective, here's. There's, we know how the where the toolkits are going. We know why they're going there. Yeah. We know that if we can provide hardware accelerated rendering to users, yeah. then them going there will actually be beneficial to them. So, I, I get I, this is not an official motto of Cubes by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a motto. It's something I like to use. Security should be no excuse for for poor user experience. And not being able to use hardware accelerated rendering is poor user experience. Yeah, that I agree. But it's still the initial question that you asked is it possible to, to actually do the, the hardware acceleration in a safe way? That's a, for me, it's still an open question. I think it's. 
That's the other question. If not, what do we need from the GPU vendors? What do the GPU vendors need to give us for this to be possible? Probably they need to give us the API that you were talking about uh, in a way that it's safe, that uh, provides some guarantees that uh, you can say completely separate the data from one application uh, from the data of another one. And that uh, whenever there is a violation there, you will get some clear uh, way to handle it. And, uh, not just uh, random lockups and, uh, and other kinds of things that you cannot recover from. Is, I will also add, at least in the cubes context, denial of service is a bug. It is not a security vulnerability. Yeah. Being able if untrusted shaders can crash the system, that is bad. It is not necessarily, at least from my perspective. And again, do not quote, do not consider, this is not an official position of Invisible Things Lab or the Cubes OS team. This is just my position. From my perspective, if a feature allows, if, if the impact can, can be bounded as this can crash the system, it cannot do anything worse. And it is off by default. Then being able to use it for something like games might still be a huge improvement over not being able to use it at all. Yes, that's... So that's also more or less the current situation that we have, for example, on uh, OpenDSD, where we port the current uh, DRM stack to the OpenDSD kernel, and we have a number of bugs. And we don't know exactly what are those bugs, otherwise they would be fixed. But most of those bugs have the, just the effect of uh, completely freezing the GPU and only a hard uh, reset of the machine uh, is able to unstuck this. This is not really satisfying, but most of the OpenBSD users are happier with that than with the previous situation where we didn't add, add any kind of uh, 3D acceleration. And, uh, I think that's. Uh, I think these. Uh, I think the long-term solution is. I think the mediated pass-through, mediated I/O approach of libvf.io has a lot of advantages as well. I think the big, the key, it has the advantage that from what I can tell, it would be much easier to use in a cloud context. And Cubes OS is a lot like a cloud. It, it's a lot, it's in a lot of ways like a cloud on, like a cloud on, a, like a little private cloud on, on your, on your desktop or laptop. And that and part of that is the security requirements. If if a cloud vendor is willing to if is willing to run code from completely untrusted from completely random customers and and trust on something to provide strong isolation, then there's a decent chance that it will be secure enough for cubes, in my opinion. I think that, but th that said, it's, there's other constraints they have that cubes doesn't have, like, like, like having to support proprietary stuff. I think that Ultimately, this is a really hard problem. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it fixed. I think changes in GPUs are going to really help in that direction. But I think there needs to be clear communication with clear information from vendors as to what's supported and what isn't. Is there any chance that you could ask? Do you have any contacts you could ask about this question? 
Well, okay. I, I can try to talk to the people who do the, the hardware drivers part on uh, OpenBSD. They have some knowledge about all this. Uh, Are you an OpenBSD developer? Yes, sir. I'm, okay. I'm one of those. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm maintaining uh, x.org on OpenBSD for 20 years or so. Of I'm trying to well, at least trying to get it to build and to ship so that we can ship something that that is reusable. I unfortunately I didn't have much time to actually work on improving X as much as I wanted to. Maybe it's time to switch to Wayland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for this we uh, we have we still have some issues. And more in the on the input side and on the graphics uh, side. Oh yeah, because you need to put lib, port lib input. Yes, exactly. Or or port or switch your or or switch your kernel API. And if if yes, but uh, this is probably going to be even harder because we have, we support architectures that uh, that won't really fit in that model and so on. So it's more it's more like porting or rewriting uh, an API compatible uh, lib input, so that uh, so that we can uh, have what we need. We we were in the past there have been some people who did some uh, very raw prototypes. Uh, we just need to find some time to actually invest some more time to make them better and more robust and expose more features. One of the things is that it's quite easy to have, like like with the, uh, the like with the with the old uh, X core input, just a keyboard and a pointer device, where you don't know exactly. You, you just have three buttons and uh, and uh, coordinates and no other properties, no gestures, and no multi-touch and so on. Then it's quite easy if you want to have the full game of all the features that uh, current input drivers uh, propose, then it's uh, quite a lot of uh, more work. Yeah. OK. We need to talk privately afterwards. Yeah, maybe. Looks like is this looks like maybe we should wrap up because. Yeah. Unless I can get, yeah, I think we've, yeah, we've said almost all yeah. we said for today. Yeah. Anyway, it was interesting. Thanks. It was interesting. How can I con? Uh, If you want to contact me, you can either contact me by email. I put it in the chat. Hopefully, I will not get more spam than uh, all that I already do. If this is public, anything. Uh... Email, uh, do you have like matrix or IRC or anything for more synchronous? I'm, I'm on the X developers IRC and also on matrix on uh, matrix uh, dot, uh, uh, dot net. Uh, if you could type that into the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, just doing one second so that I get it correctly. Up. Ah, sorry, I forgot one error. That's the correct one. I just sent you an I'm just I'm sending you an invite right now. Yeah, see, I'm seeing it. Did you get it? Yes. Joining room. It's running. Okay, so I think we can 
summarize it is. Yeah, I wish I was hoping. I'm. I must admit, I was hoping for a better outcome <laughs> and a bigger audience, maybe more people. For yeah. The discussion. Yeah. But nonetheless, thanks all for attending, especially Demi for leading this session, and see you soon on the next workshop. See you. See you. Bye. 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 See you.